Good morning, everybody. Good morning, John. Mm -hmm. Glad to see you all here today. Um, I left this up early. I had forgotten this in that last week, the last time I taught, rather. I didn't have God is my father. You guys are my caretakers, sure. But God is my father. I'm doing what he's asked me to do. I'm keeping that short. There's a lot more to it. We can do multiple sermons on it. Now, thankfully, after this reunion here, it says that he dutifully went back with his parents home. He obeyed them. He grew, it says, in stature and favor and more knowledge, etc. And this past went on, went on. Now, there's something to be said here about the parents faithfully not only teaching their child the word. I mean, Christ still had to be exposed to the word on that front <clears throat> and taking him to church, synagogue, whatever you want to call it at that point in time. And if you go back to, again, in Genesis, when we first open up the series, I talked about the importance of the family and marriage and the holy marriage that God has set up. Why? Well, it's one, because it's a representation of God in the church, but the second part is that it builds a healthy society. You teach your children about God. They teach their children about God, etc. This is passed on generation to generation. And we see this happening successfully, at least here, between Joseph and Mary and their son, and the difference that it's making on that front. Now, when Mary left, did she really understand what Jesus was saying? No, she was kind of confused. <clears throat> And it says that she kept all these things in her heart. Some of the translations says she pondered these things. Have you ever had a moment like this? Where God gives you some weird message or someone you bump into out of nowhere or dreams. I've had talks with people recently about dreams about that. So what do you think this means? And it's like, it really does seem like it's from God, but we don't really know yet. So you kind of keep it in your heart. You keep praying about it, thinking about it, going, God... You gave this message, this sign, I'm just not quite sure what to apply it to yet. And Mary was hanging on to this. She recognized this was something dealing with God. She just needed to put the, the lines together down um, in years to come. So we're going to jump ahead to chapters 3 and 4. <clears throat> and we're moving on to where he's an adult. He's being baptized at the Jordan, uh, the Jordan, I believe it was. Uh, when all the people were baptized, it came to pass that Jesus also was baptized. And while he prayed, the heaven was opened. And the Holy Spirit descended in bodily form like a dove upon him. And a voice came from heaven which said, You are my beloved Son, in you I am well pleased. And then jumping forward to chapter 4. It says, Then Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit to Galilee, and news of him went out throughout all the surrounding region. And he taught in their synagogues, being glorified by all. So he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up. And as his custom was, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up to read. And he was handed the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to preach the gospel <coughs> of the poor. He sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. <coughs> and he closed the book and gave it back to the attendant and sat down. And the eyes of all who were in the synagogue were fixed on him. And he began to say to them, Today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. So going back to chapter 3, starting this, who baptized Jesus? John the Baptist, John the Baptist oddly enough. It's easy to remember on that front. What was John's message? Very simple. Behold the Lamb of God. Okay, that was, that was when Christ appeared, yes. To the people before Christ, what was his message? Repent, Repent for the kingdom of God is near, is at hand, etc., right? And above that, when the Pharisees showed up, he elaborated and said, the kingdom of God is near and the wrath of God is to come. As in, you need to start picking which side of the fence you're going to be on here. Now, many people ask, did Jesus need to be baptized? I mean, did he need to repent? He was already the sinless son of God, right? He's fulfilling the law. Okay, so there's a couple different understandings here is that he said, because even John questioned him, he's like, I, you should be baptizing me. I'm nobody. You're the Son of God. You are the Lamb of God that you know, was called out. And he says, permit it for all righteousness, right, was his response here, is that he was identifying with the faithful Jews that were coming to John to repent, to be the faithful of God. Um, and Jesus is basically saying, I'm in that picking my side of defense. I'm in that party. When he... Uh when he got the, the Spirit of God on him to go out on his earth. Right, and that's what it said after he was baptized, the yeah. Spirit of God came down as a dove visibly after God approved. Dennis, there, quickly. There's also something important to realize that in, in, the, in the Jewish culture, that every time a, 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 prop, a priest changed his position in the, in the temple, 
he was baptized. And it was a designation that occurred that you have left your old office and taken on a new. Okay. Does Christ indicate? demonstrated he has left his former position and has taken on new authority. And he demonstrated that. They understood that. Okay, so Christ is taking on a new position as a priest. Go ahead, Clyde. Um, he did it funny, as an example for us, too. We need to be baptized. And we need to remember faith. Even though Jesus didn't need to, but he did it as an example. Okay, so he said an example that we were to be Christ-like, that we were, okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. He was also, he was acknowledging, this will come up later, that John's ministry was of God. Because later people would question that. He's like, listen, when I've been baptized by the guy, if he wasn't sent by God... And the other part here, as we saw with the words that came afterwards, that he was fulfilling God's will. God asked him to do it, and as unusual as it sounded, Jesus went along with it. That's what we're to do. God asks us to do weird things sometimes, and our response is, okay, <laughs> you've gotten through me through it before, I suppose you'll do it again. But this obedience led to basically this appearance, this completion of the Trinity. You already had Christ there. You had the audible word of God. And then you had the visible appearance of the Holy Spirit. So you had the Trinity there. The Holy Spirit was empowering Christ to take upon this ministry. This is the start, so to speak, of his outpouring, his, his evangelism ministry. And the, the form of the dove, if you remember back even to Noah's Ark, was, Ark was a, a sign of peace. It was an offering of peace, of reconciliation between God and man. And here was a lighting upon Christ, again, him performing the same responsibility for us. But it was empowering for him him for what was going to come next. Again, if you jump back to a different gospel to Matthew, we see that immediately after this, Jesus spent the 40 days and nights in the wilderness being tempted by the devil. He would have needed the Holy Spirit, not only for the hunger, but to deal with that situation there. But having thrown that gauntlet down, successfully passing that test, he moves on to this evangelism, which we discussed in chapter 4. So he goes to the temple. It wasn't unusual for them to say, does anyone have a word? In which case, men could stand up, read a word from um, the Bible and elaborate upon it, <clears throat> enlighten people. Christ does it here, refers to Isaiah, and basically says, I'm the fulfillment of this messianic prophecy. And he sits back down. Well, I think he did that um, in his hometown, not in Jerusalem. Right, and well, his hometown wasn't exactly favorable to him, as we see elsewhere. Have you actually pictured this scene, though? I mean, <coughs> the crickets, after he sits down, and everyone just... Eyes bugging out of their head like, this guy for real? Who is this guy? This is the carpenter's son. This is just some schmuck. He's uneducated. How? What? This had to have been insane. Now, getting back to John here, we've moved more move on because we always skip this part. Why is repentance such an important part of the gospel? Because we always fail. Okay. You know, God made us to fail all the time. In my opinion, you know, which isn't worth is that God wants us to fail. So he is revolting. Okay, we're sinful people is the short of what he said. Well, it becomes and, a reality, though, when you express the fact that you have failed and you've also sinned against God and that you also humble yourself to ask God for your forgiveness. Right. When we're sin, we, you can't recognize the need for a Savior unless you acknowledge the fact that you're sinful which is what this is all about, is that I'm a simple person. God didn't create me to fail, but God gave me free will. I failed, and he's working through it. And then we, again, going back to the Old Testament, is that the Ten Commandments, the law, how many of you upheld those for any length of time? You failed those before you even knew about them. And it's like, that's so unfair. No, the Old Testament law was given to show us that we cannot fulfill the righteous requirements of perfection. That's what it is there for. It pointed to Christ. This is the fulfillment of it. This is the, the, the hope that we've been having. And we've got to move on. Continuing in chapter 4, verses 31 to 37. Then Jesus went down to Capernaum, a city of Galilee, and was teaching them on the Sabbaths. And they were astonished at his teaching, for his word was with authority. Now in the synagogue there was a man who had the spirit of an unclean demon. And the man cried out with a loud voice, saying, Let us alone. What do we have to do with you, Jesus of Nazareth? Did you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be quiet, come out of him. And when the demon had thrown him in their midst, it came out of him and did not hurt him. Then they were all amazed and spoke among themselves, saying, What word is this? For with authority and power he commands the unclean spirits, and they come out. And the report about him went out into every place in the surrounding region. 
Now, as I saw earlier, Jesus loved spending his time on the Sabbath, Sundays, whatever, teaching in the synagogues, that would be churches. And again, like the child's childhood, the Pharisees were still astonished at his teachings. And I'm going to have to answer these questions due to our time. <clears throat> what was so special about his teaching is that he taught with authority. That is, he wasn't referring, as the custom was, to other teachers, to current religious fads, whatever the case may be. Well, this guy said this, and this guy said this, and look on how many books I've read. No, Jesus taught out of the word of God, as if he had wrote it himself which you all should be nodding your heads saying, yes, he did write it himself. We opened up with a passage earlier that through him, these authors wrote the word of God. John opens up with saying, in the beginning was the word, the word was with God, the word was God. Jesus was the embodiment of the word. Now, the, this truth here apparently agitated the demon-possessed man in the presence. And ironically, the demon recognized Christ's divinity as a son of God and his purpose as the savior of mankind. Yet the people there, right over, hey Bruno, right over their head, now, according to the Pharisees, what was so special about Christ's exorcism? And it's the same thing, is that he had power and, again, authority. And they'd be comparing elsewhere, saying, we can't do that. Our exorcists can't do that sort of thing. But again, the idea is that demons have always been subject to God, past, present, and the future, remaining future that they had. God still today keeps Satan on a leash. Does he have run of the world? Yes, much of it, but he has limits. If you read the book of Job, you'll get examples of that. Now, when Christ returns, he will fully exercise his authority and power and banish them to hell once and for all. <laughs> Moving on to chapter 5. Verses 17 to 26. Now, it happened on a certain day as he was teaching that there were Pharisees and teachers of the law sitting by who had come out of every town of Galilee, Judea, and Jerusalem, and the power of the Lord was present to heal them. Then behold, <laughs> men brought on a bed a man who was paralyzed, whom they sought to bring in and lay before him. And when they could not find how they might bring him in because of the crowd, they went up on the housetop and let him down on his bed through the roof into the midst before Jesus. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to them, Man, your sins are forgiven you. And the scribes and the Pharisees began to reason, saying, Who is this who speaks blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God alone? But when Jesus perceived their thoughts, he answered and said to them, Why are you reasoning in your hearts? Which is easier to say, your sins are forgiven you, or to say, rise up and walk? But that you may know that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins. He said to the man who was paralyzed, I say to you, arise, take up your bed, and go to your house. Immediately the man rose up before them, took what he had been lying on, and departed to his own house, glorifying God. And they were all amazed, and they glorified God, and were filled with fear, saying, we have seen strange things today. Now, interestingly, with these situations of the, the exorcism, the miracle here and elsewhere, what was Christ doing before and after he performed these miracles? We opened up the passage with it. He was teaching. There's an important part about this, that the miracles served to prove his origin and his authority. But they didn't save souls. They got your attention. They got you to believe the person that was speaking. But even those that Christ raised from the dead still eventually died again of old age. And if they did so without repenting, they still died separated from God. The miracle was meaningless without the teaching, without the gospel, without understanding that reconciliation that was necessary, without understanding that repentance was needed. These signs and wonders would have just been a distraction. The gospel must accompany miracles. They go hand in hand. If you do not have the gospel with the miracles, stay away. And this is especially true in the world today where everyone wants the fireworks show or they want the quick fix and make me well and then I'll forget all about you. Um, well, find a miracle, though. I don't have time to do that right now. The Pharisees show us an example was another well, example of this. Or show us, you know, they, they constantly were saying, show us another sign, show us another sign. And Christ's response was always, why? You don't believe the word that I'm speaking. What are these miracles going to do? And the people followed along with that. Now, the Pharisees in this case here, the pastors read, are irritated with Christ's claim to forgive the paralytic sin. Now, rightfully so, who can do that besides God? That's in the Word. I would understand if they had not already known Christ's ministries and seen his previous miracles to be a little suspect of what the man was saying. That would have been blasphemous behavior, except they had seen and heard his previous words and actions. Now, in response to this, Christ offered a miracle to prove his divinity, our sinful nature, and our need for redemption. And as a logical person, I love the logic he uses here. 
And that is, which is easier to say to a paralytic person, your sins are forgiven to you, or rise up and walk? Now, if I tell any of you in the crowd here that your sins are forgiven, how can you prove that that's accurate? You can't. There's no sign. There's no beam of light that comes down on you, angelic wings, oh, sound, and you float up through the ceiling. It doesn't work that way. <laughs> However, if I tell a par paralytic, rise up and walk, and he does it, that's very visible proof that what I am saying is true on this front, and of course, that's what he did. Now, you may say, I've seen plenty of faith healers say, be healed, and slap someone on the forehead, and he falls down, he gets up, and he can walk again, he can speak again, he can hear again, whatever the case may be. Does that mean they can also forgive sin? No, again, we read the rest of the Bible, we're going to understand all men are sinful. Men do not have the ability to forgive sin. So my question in these situations here where someone's slapping them on the forehead and they're apparently healed is, stereotypes aside, was the gospel included with the message? Healings are a real thing. The question was what came of it. Did the person get up and heal and go home and go back to sinning? Or was the word of God preached and that sign of healing encouraged people to believe in Christ and the message that he sent? If we're not preaching, Satan specifically, if you remember, knows the word of God. And Satan can imitate miracles, healings, etc. That's in the scripture as well. But Satan will never preach about Christ's divinity, his sinless life, his death, his reconciliation, and his exclusive means of redemption with God. Because the world today will mix miracles in, but then say, oh, it's one of many ways. Or you don't really need to repent, etc. If you don't have all of it, it's still a lie. We're going to get there. We're jumping on to John, chapter 19. Moving on to the end. It says, Then Pilate delivered Jesus to the Jews to be crucified, and they took him and led him away. And he, bearing his cross, went out to a place called the Place of the Skull, which in Hebrew is called Golgotha, where they crucified him, and two others with him, one on either side, and Jesus in the center. This is a fulfillment of prophecy. Again, if you read the Old Testament, you know that. After this, Jesus, knowing that all things were accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled, said, I thirst. Now a vessel of sour wine was sitting there, and they filled a sponge with the wine, put it on hyssop, and put it to his mouth. When he had received the wine, he said, It is finished. And bowing his head, he gave up his spirit. And therefore, because it was the preparation day that the body should not remain on the cross on the Sabbath, for that Sabbath was a high day, the Jews asked Pilate that the legs might be broken, that is, that they would die faster or immediately. They couldn't take down bodies on the holy day. They needed to do it now before that holiday started. So the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and the other who was crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. That fulfilled another prophecy. But one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, another prophecy, and immediately blood and water came out. And he who has seen, that is the author here, has testified, and his testimony is true. And he knows that he's telling the truth so that you may believe. For these things were done that the scripture should be fulfilled. Jumping down to verse 38. And after this, Joseph of Arimathea, being a disciple of Jesus, but secretly, for fear of the Jews, asked Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus. And Pilate gave him permission. And he came and took the body of Jesus. And Nicodemus, who at first came to Jesus by night, also came. He was a Pharisee. He brought a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about 100 pounds. They took the body of Jesus, bound it in strips of linen with the spices, as was the custom of Jews to bury. Now in the place where he was crucified, there was a garden. And in the garden, a new tomb, which no one had yet been laid. So there they laid Jesus because of the Jews' preparation day, for the, Jew, the tomb was nearby. So the Pharisees, who were constantly looking for those ways to entrap Jesus, finally got their wish. And basically, they incited a riot and blackmailed the governor. You kill this guy, or we're going to riot, and you're going to lose your job. And he wanted to save his own neck, so he went along with it. Now, the death initially included Jesus' arrest, but then it had verbal and light physical abuse. Uh, his friends abandoned him. This then progressed to being spat upon, being severely beaten, having thorns pressed into his brow, being flayed alive, then being forced to march to his execution location with the weight of his cross on his shoulders, and then being nailed to a cross to die a slow, painful death of exposure and eventual suffocation. Now, this period of the cross is only best understood, again, when you read all the Gospels. John here was an eyewitness to this from start to finish. So he, this is why he put in there, I have seen this. But many Old Testament prophecies were fulfilled, and we discussed a lot of them already. Now, in verse 28, he says, is it finished? His work had been accomplished. What was that? 
he faced the punishment for our sins. The wrath of God that should be on us for all the sins we've committed was on Christ. He died in our place. He ended up facing, again, if you read all the Gospels, a separation from God. God turned his back on his own son. Jesus did not take that lightly. That was the worst part of the entire torment that he went through. But it was a burden that he was willing to bear on our behalf. And he had said previously to his disciples, greater love has no one than this, that one should lay down their lives for his friends. That's what Christ did for us. He took that torment, that punishment on our behalf. Why? Because he loved us. We were his friends. Now, this loss of blood from the beatings, etc., thankfully, air quotes, sped up his death on the cross, and he was only up there for hours only, instead of days as was the normal. And I already discussed how they rushed to bury him after the fact. Now, we don't have time to read the remaining passages in John, in my last slide even entirely. We talk afterwards how the women went to the tomb after the holy day and found that it had been opened that he had been resurrected, that he spoke to them in person, even though they didn't recognize him at first. But the point here is that Christ had conquered death, and this is something that's promised to us. He was reborn in a new body, again, something promised to us. I don't have to worry about age and disease and sin or any of the results afterwards of a work that's no longer rewarding, enjoyable, etc. All the stuff we discussed in Genesis is part of the curses of the world around us and our punishments will no longer apply. And above that, Christ pointed to the coming of the Holy Spirit, something that we have today. He said, when I was here, I could only be in one place at one time. But with the Holy Spirit, I can be with all of you, all the time, no matter where you are at. If you believe in me, you have that gift even today. You can have Christ with you. You can speak to him at any point in time. You don't have to go to a priest or a special location. You don't even have to go up to the altar. Do so, if God's calling you to do so. <laughs> But you can do it at home, in the bathroom, in the shower, on your drive to work, whatever the case may be. Christ is always available to us as that intercessor. He's a middle man. What's that? He's a middle man. No, he's he, God. He can... Well... He's a middle man between God. us and God. He, he is, is God. He is God. He is Gentlemen, he is, he is God, but he acts as an intercessor between us. <laughs> there you go. Okay. Tell it to the judge. Some sort of mince words, yes. <laughs> Tell it to the judge. That's exactly what he's doing. He will do it for us. So, we have those things to look forward to. Read the Gospels, get a better understanding together of all the witnesses, and how that still applies to us today. And again, thank you, Lord, for your Son and what he accomplished for us. And how uh, you may bless us today. I ask that you bless our pastor, the worship to come, and open up your words to us this week. Draw us closer to you. In your Son's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.